name is Barbara Fry, and I'm the director of the Human Rights Program and um, one of the co-chairs of this collaboration, along with Alejandro Vera and Joaquin Stavelsburg. And I would like to welcome any new faces we have this afternoon, and uh, hope that people here for the day have a nice, uh, a little bit of a break, um, and enjoy the sunshine from the inside, if not from the outside. So this morning's session focused on the politics of memory and the politics of history. In this session, we're going to be looking at post-communist Europe through a related lens, and that is the politics of accountability. And we're going to focus our regional perspective in on a specific set of experiences in, in former Yugoslavia. I would like to say it's one country, but it's not one country, it's many countries. Uh, but um, has a particular experience um, in uh, the post-communist era of Europe, which it, it includes uh, uh, patterns of violence and atrocities um, committed af at not only after the Holocaust, but after the communist era and um, into the modern era, the current era. Now, Alejandro Baer started our discussion this morning with a reference to the transnational human rights culture and how it has affected the discourse of, um, of memory in, in uh, this region as well as other regions. Now, as a human rights lawyer, I have observed how advocates have pushed for and defined the normative legal concepts that have shaped the modern discourse on accountability. And um, especially in the immediate aftermath of World War II and in the aftermath of the Cold War, so in the late 40s and in the early 90s, we saw a particular push for the codification, codification of new norms, specific norms that would require not only um, uh, political prohibitions, but actual criminal accountability for certain kinds of violations. Uh, Professor Catherine Sicking calls this modern era of accountability the age of accountability, uh, noting the, the kind of domestic trials and truth commissions, regional uh, tribunals, and uh, the international tribunal, the International Criminal Court, that kind of characterize different uh, streams that uh, have run into what she calls the justice cascade, which is a, a, a new norm of accountability. So the kind of codifications involved in, in this were, were often championed by those who experienced or witnessed atrocities personally. So Raphael Lemkin, familiar to many of us as the person who coined the term genocide, himself a, a Polish Jewish jurist who um, grew up witnessing the pogroms and um, as well as studying the histories of other groups of, uh, who were targeted for violence. And that, that those experiences uh, impacted his beliefs about the need for specific legal protections for those um, who were parts of national, ethnical, racial, or religious groups. Similarly, advocacy to develop a legal norm to prohibit disappearance, or the crime of disappearance, even named from the practice that exists in Latin America, was deeply affected by those who, uh, who, who experienced the, the pattern unfold across that continent in the 60s and 70s. So these legal norms are, are viewed in human rights as important advances, and they're used to name and shame governments and to hold individuals accountable for crimes now deemed to be of international significance. As we see, however, in the kind of history and memory conversation we've been discussing, the use of these legal categories can be problematic as well prone to manipulation. First, terms like genocide and disappearance, which are framed as a result of a particular experience, become imprecise or inadequate almost the minute that the ink is dry on the 
the legal document. Because they are so narrowly defined and come from such specific experiences, they lead to exclusions and limitations. So these legal categories create rankings and, and the kinds of priorities that can invite or worsen competitive victimization that we discussed earlier today. Why, for instance, are groups who are killed on the basis of ideology or gender not worthy of the crime of genocide, while those killed on the basis of race and religion are? So these are some of the, um, some of the thoughts and questions we have about this notion of, of accountability and um, as a frame and accountability politics in specific. And the former Yugoslavia plays a very important role in the development of this kind of accountability po politics as the site of the first ad hoc tribunal that was created by the international community to address crimes uh, resulting from the wars of the, of the early 90s. Former Yugoslavia also represents in Europe a site of multiple transitions requiring multiple accountabilities. So we're really pleased to have with us today um, a great panel to, to um, come at this issue from their own perspectives. I'll introduce each of them in turn, and we're, we're going to start with Sarah Wagner, who is the Associate Professor of Anthropology from the George Washington University. Um, she works in the former Yugoslavia and in the United States as the site of her research. And her work explores the connections between the destructive and creative forces of war. Her books include To Know Where He Lives, Where He Lies, sorry, To Know Where He Lies, DNA Technology, and the Search for Shevernitsa's Missing in 2008. And she recently co-authored with Laura Nettlefield, Shevernitsa in the Aftermath of Genocide. Prior to joining George Washington, she's taught at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and at Harvard University, and she got her PhD in, in social anthropology from Harvard, and uh, uh, a master's from the Fletcher School at Tufts, and, it, and uh, graduated from Dartmouth. So, welcome, Sarah. <laughs> typically have a softer voice, so I'll we'll benefit us all. First of all, my thanks to Barb and to Alejandro for inviting me to participate. I also want to um, just make a, a, a personal thanks. My brother and father are here today, and my father, who is a historian, drove all the way from North Dakota. And uh, so I get to acknowledge both his presence, but also his influence in helping me think through my research, both in Bosnia and the US, in terms of the long durée. So, all right. Let's get to work then. So the title of my talk, Recognizing the Srebrenica is Missing. Return, Reconstruction, Recognition, Reconciliation. For the past two decades, the language of post-war Bosnia and Herzegovina has been saturated with intimations of what once was, or what was imagined to be, and the need to bring it back into existence. In these words, Bosnia's recent past serves as the referent for verbs of restoration and rehabilitation as those who employ them attempt to bridge a gap between a pre-genocide, pre-rape, and pre-flight place, and, in, and, and envision harmoniously multi-ethnic and functional state. Such an impulse to render order and rewrite wrongs is not unique to Bosnia, as we just heard. Such an impulse, uh, rather, attempts at redress and repair are part of a larger discourse of international interventionism in post-conflict societies that has emerged over the past half century whose key concepts include reparation politics and transitional justice. In this paper, I examine an unusual form of such intervention, a recent addition to the International Post-Conflicts Toolkit, the efforts to identify mortal remains of persons missing as a consequence of the 1992 to 1995 war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Amid the post-war tallying of destruction, displacement, and death, Bosnia's missing persons have occupied important, though contentious, political ground. The numbers attest to the lopsided losses across the ethnic groups, Bosniak, Bosnian Muslim, Bosnian Serb, and Bosnian Croat, as well as to the relative success of the DNA-led identification process. 
of the 31,000 estimated missing at the end of the war, arguably the most visible among Bosnia's missing were the 8,000 Bosniak men and boys killed by the Army of Republika Srpska forces that overran the UN safe area of Srebrenica. To date, of the over 17,000 individuals identified through DNA analysis, the missing persons identified through DNA analysis, 6,922 cases are from the Srebrenica genocide. The identification process thus has been relatively successful in returning remains to surviving. But what are the more intangible goals underpinning the efforts? How has this form of international interventionism, of forensic science applied toward socio-political repair, fared in post-war Bosnia? To answer the question, we must first appreciate the country's political structure, namely a structure that continues to divide the population, territory, and government according to ethno-national identity. The problematic constrictive design arises from the Dayton Peace Agreement signed in December 1995, which, in its attempt to codify plurality, split the country into two entities, the Bosniak and Croat Controlled Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the Bosnian Serb Controlled Republika Srpska. Within the context of this politically divided post-war state, the issue of missing persons becomes a useful vehicle to think illuminating moments of engagement between post-conflict nation states and international concepts of order and rights that have given rise to pursuits such as truth and reconciliation commissions, tribunals, and memorial centers. Forensic science applied towards post-conflict repair, social repair, exposes tensions between the ideological prescriptions of modern liberal democracy embedded in projects of nation building and the complex circumstances of a society defined both externally and internally along ethno oppositional ethno-national lines. But it's not just about grand gestures, state building, and politics with large. Identifying this in persons affects the everyday lives of the war survivors. For them, identification is about recognition. Recognition is a useful word to recognize because it can refer to a range of physical and social actions, of unscripted emotion, and political discourse. For indeed, the biotechnological innovation that has successfully returned names to remains and coffins to grieving families involves layers of recognition, from the instant of a blind DNA match to the moment a relative spies a still familiar piece of clothing recovered with the remains of her loved one. Recognition radiates out from the most immediate to the more distant. Its most intimate and powerful iteration is when families recognize, accept the identification of their loved one. Whether through personal possessions, when a surviving relative touches the cloth of an article she herself may have stitched, or the act of accepting the forensic evidence that documents the identity of a missing husband or son or brother. From the familial, we move to the communal. Srebrenica as a community is a complex network of social relations whose layers of voices, from refugees who have returned to their pre-war homes, to those who've made their permanent residence in the cities of Tuzla and Sarajevo, to the diaspora in places as disparate as St. Louis, Missouri, and Sydney, Australia. This is not always a harmonious community, and consensus often escapes its members especially given the competing political aims and different definitions of who speaks for Srebrenica. Beyond this effect within the community, there is post-war Bosnian society. And it is here that I'm focusing my discussion in this presentation, on the countervailing discourses of tabulating loss, where the work of scientific recognition intersects with the field of socio-political recognition. In these multivalent instances of recognizing the past and lost lives, two arguments emerge. First, while we know that on a familial level, identification succeeds in bridging gaps of knowledge and enabling witnessed, sanctified burial, on a more abstract societal level, the political interpretation of bodies recovered and reburied has at times exacerbated tensions in post-war Bosnia. Second, 
forensic intervention into the missing persons issue, namely the successful identification of Srebrenica's missing, has effectively raised the stakes of facticity, forcing both Bosnians and Bosnian Serbs to document their losses in increasingly quantifiable terms. Let's consider the first argument, that the results of identification, specifically how bodies recovered and buried, get reanimated within political discourse, that that at times has driven a wedge between the post-war populations of Eastern Bosnia. Nowhere is this more apparent than when comparing Bosniak and Bosnian Serb memorials relating to the July 11 genocide and the wartime violence in the region. These respective commemorative spaces and practices reveal how bodies recovered and identified have led to very different, often competing ethno-national narratives of wartime loss and victimhood. In the case of the Bosniak leadership, again, the Bosnian Muslim leadership, the Srebrenica Potocaj Memorial Center provides the discursive space to forge a new nationalism, one based as much on blood spill as on blood inheritance. On July 11, each year, tens of thousands of people, the overwhelming majority of them Bosnians, assemble at the center for the annual commemoration and mass burial of victims whose remains were identified during the preceding year. In the vast field within the complex, it can be difficult to separate out, separate out the overtones of the political overtones from the religious messages in the commemorative segment of the ceremony. The funeral prayers and burial processions reinforce this impression. Covered in bright green cloth and borne across a bridge of outstretched hands, the coffins themselves are explicitly marked as Islamic. In fact, all the victims of the Srebrenica genocide, except for one, a Catholic, has been, have been declared Shahidi, martyrs, regardless of the fact that some individuals may not have actively practiced the religion, and indeed others may have considered themselves brought up during the Yugoslav era of Bratsko Yedinsko, Brotherhood and Unity, as communist and by extension atheist. Like the coffins, the tombstones that cap the mounds of earth and spare grass are identical. Slender white columns of marble bearing the victims' names, birth date, and hometown, as well as a line from the Quran which reads, and call not those who are slain in the way of Allah dead. Nay, they are living. Only you perceive them. Thus, through speeches, prayers, religious markings, and rituals, the July 11th commemoration and mass burials reascribe collective identity, crafting new ethno-religious nationalism in response to the dev devastation of the July 1995 genocide. Given the overt narrative of Bosniak victimhood, and by extension, Serb criminality cultivated in the memorial center, it comes as no surprise that Bosnian Serbs in the region tend to ignore, and in some cases openly spurn the public fruition of the Srebrenica-related identification efforts. One of the most revealing physical monuments to this subverted claim to remember the violence and mourn the missing takes place in the village of Pilica, located some 50 kilometers north of Srebrenica. Pilica is known for its Dom Kultura, its, its cultural center, the buildings and the building in which some 600 Srebrenica victims were detained and executed on July 16, 1995. It is a place my colleague and co-author, Laura Netterfield, and I visited in 2010 when we accompanied a convoy of surviving family members, specifically the women of Srebrenica, as they traveled to sites of detention and execution to lay flowers and pray for the dead on July 13, two days after the annual commemoration at the Center. The final stop of this pilgrimage, the Pilisa Cultural Center, was the only building among the sites visited with which the survivors were not allowed to enter that year. This would change in subsequent years. Trash littered the building's threshold, angering some of the women as they picked their way around the piles of refuse. Once inside, an overwhelming sense of horror seemed to fill the air. Bullet holes covered the walls, and large pieces of the center's roof dangled from the ceiling. Dry flowers from the same visit the year before lay at the end of one room. No one had touched them in the interim. Nothing identified the building 
as a site of mass atrocities. On the contrary, the facility was rotting away and with it the potential that it would give, it would continue to give witness to the crimes committed within its walls. In fact, the cultural center served as a backdrop to a much more visible, acknowledged set of monuments. There, just in front of the center, stood another memorial dedicated to an entirely different narrative, literally next to and on top of a World War II monument for Tito's anti-fascist partisans. Local officials had erected a memorial in the preceding year to Bosnian Serb, that is, Army of Republika Srpska soldiers, residents of Pilica who perished between 1992 and 1995. Despite, or perhaps through its clashing symbols, the clumsy yoking of the Orthodox cross with the explicitly atheist emblem of the partisan red star, the memorial's designers purposefully conjoined the older World War II memorial to the more recent conflict, retroactively christening the local partisan resistance and effectively excising from public memory the events that took place in the nearby cultural center. To the right of the 24 individual memorial slates for the fallen Bo Bosnian Serb soldiers, an inscription exhorts God to, quote, grant them eternal glory and forgive their souls, end quote. The display of youthful faces, their names as well as dates of birth and death etched into the black stone, recall the stylized Serb tombstones found throughout the cemeteries in eastern Bosnia. At the same time, they embodied the intentional erasure of the victims held captive and slaughtered in the building just meters away. After hearing a perpetrator's testimony about the 1995 killings that took place there, prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, Mark Harmon, traveled to the site. He describes here his shock at the blatant disinterest he encountered among Bosnian Serbs in the village. Sitting in this company, so indifferent, or maybe scarred, or whatever, and asking myself, what is it that presents, pre prevents normal human beings from doing their moral duty and testifying about a crime, was the most horrifying experience of my life. I was greatly moved by Srebrenica, but it was the, the visit to Pilica that upset me in particular, since I saw that a monument to, I saw that a monument to dead Serb soldiers had been erected in front of the culture center. These men had died for their cause, believing in what they were doing. But it was highly arrogant to erect a monument to them in front of the site of one of the most shameful crimes in the whole, the whole war in Bosnia Herzegovina. I tell you, it was the most shocking thing. What Harman perceives as arrogance, <coughs> erecting the monument in front of the site of torture and detention, is part of the same political disciplining of public memory through selective remembering and forgetting that Bosnian Serb officials urged throughout the entity. Indeed, as Dutch anthropologist Pierre Duizings notes, such attempts at revising and aligning public histories were part of a, quote, much wider effort to inscribe a new political order into the landscape. Crosses were installed, new Orthodox churches were built, and mosques were torn down. Streets, schools, villages were renamed. Through these changes, Serbs sent a clear message that there was no place for Muslims in Luka <laughs> Thus, rather than building a cohesive national identity around shared experiences of loss and violence, the identified bones, reclaimed landscapes, and commemorative spaces of Potocaya and Pilica speak to divided publics. They are not in conversation with one another, except to challenge the opposing narrative of the war and its consequences. Now let me turn briefly to the other side of the coin, the other arguments we <coughs> made about the biotechnology's socio-political consequences in post-war Bosnia. Beyond the rhetoric of July 11, the work of scientific recognition has, in short, raised the stakes of facticity. It is no longer possible for Bosnian Serb or Serbian authorities to deny, diminish, or dismiss the circumstances and the number of missing of Srebrenica July 1995 without confronting the empirical evidence of identification. Gone are the days when they can speak in generalities about so-called commensurable loss. The most obvious example of this came at the beginning of one of the most important trials at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. It was when indicted war criminal Radovan Karadzic attempted to discredit the numbers and types of victims of Srebrenica July 1990. 
Before his status conference at the ICTY, Karadzic staked his claim, however problematically, through the language of DNA, saying, this is the last ever opportunity for us to clarify what happened in Bosnia, and particularly in Srebrenica. I assure you that we are talking about the differences that can be numbered in the thousands of victims, thousands, not tens. Creating a myth on erroneous facts about Srebrenica can cost Europe as well, because this gives legitimacy to a number of erroneous facts that can turn the anger of the general public against Europe. And this cannot be clarified if we believe one expert was wrong about one case. We want to be absolutely sure who was a victim there and how many there were. I just want to find the truth, and we can't do that based on examples and a sample. And this is the least sacrifice that this court can do to allow my experts to see every single piece of material, all the DNA analysis, individual postmortems, and then we will end up with the true list, the correct list of victims, which will differ by thousands in respect of what is believed at the moment. Of course, his task was visible. He sought to scrutinize the results of the DNA-based identification system to correct the facts not for himself, per se, but for humanity, for Europe's sake. If you know Karadic, you realize I'm saying that tongue in cheek. <laughs> but you see, he had to engage with the scientific work of recognition, hmm. with the evidence of forensic genetics, not to mention anthropology and archaeology. And there, of course, he fails. When I first read Karadic's words, I couldn't help but remember another conversation I had when I was in the field almost a decade ago. It was 2004, with the head Muslim cleric of the Tuzla Canton, Mufti Hussein Effendia Kovacevic. Kovacevic had been a strong advocate for the many displaced persons from the Srebrenica enclave living in and around the city of Tuzla. And he worked closely with the women of Srebrenica, as well as with members of the forensic community carrying out the exhumations of the Srebrenica mass graves. Notably, in 2012, Mufti Kovacevic became Rey Skulolema, the Grand Mufti, of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and in this role has continued to press all Bosnians to confront the evils of the past, Srebrenica included, as well as acts of extremist violence within and beyond Bosnia. In that discussion back in 2004, I remember Mufti Kovacevic was talking about his hopes for the Srebrenica Kofichari Memorial Center. He saw it as a space that could make manifest the scale of not only Bosnia but also human loss that took place at Srebrenica. He saw it was a means to replace myths with facts, in this case, scientifically established facts of individual victims identified and reburied. He envisioned that someday busloads of Bosnia and Bosnian Serb children would travel to the Memorial Center to visit the cemetery and the accompanying museum. Reis Kovacevic's vision for the Memorial Center's pedagogic future makes sense, as does its underlying premise and ideal, that history built on facts, not myths, enables long-term stability and peace. But the realization of this envisioned mutual understanding has been slow to take effect. The work of scientific recognition has yet to spur broader shared recognition of the significance and the consequences of the Srebrenica genocide. And in Eastern Bosnia, uh, Bosnia Bosniak and Bosnian Serb communities recall different, divided accounts of the wartime violence at spaces set apart from one another, Kotocari and Pilica, recognizing their losses also apart from one another. This brings me to a final point, one that picks up on a question that Alejandro posed at the beginning of, in his opening remarks this morning. <clears throat> when does this period of post-conflict transition end? I would add to this, when do genocide's harms, its deep cuts, begin to heal? Is it, as Reis Kovacevic hopes, when the next generation learns the facts of his past and takes the reins of its future? <coughs> These are questions that my co-author Laura Nelfield and I also posed in our recent book, Srebrenica and the Aftermath of Genocide, as we thought about the myriad interventions of redress and repair that have been attempted in post-war Bosnia, specifically post-war Srebrenica. With the 20th anniversary of the Srebrenica genocide approaching fast, July 11th this summer, we urge for caution and a recognition of who and what sets the bar for Bosnia's repair. 
I'll end with final passage as we reflect on the pressures of time and the aims of transitional justice and agendas of social reconstruction. We wrote, liberal interventionist expectations of nation building plot milestones of repair on a fast track, a swift return of the rule of law, internationally monitored elections within months of a peace treaty. With stabilized currency, integrated police and military forces, and harmonized educational curricula to follow shortly thereafter. Postmodernist capitalism with its time-space compression demands reform and reparations, not just on political and economic planes. The expectation to hurry up and move forward extends into the daily lives of survivors caught between nationalist agendas of remembering and international appeals to forgive and forget. But in addressing the immediate problems of, of post-conflict society, interventions and their sponsors or implemented, implementers often ask a great deal, perhaps too much, from the people for whom suffering and loss <coughs> remain a permanent part of their daily lives. Among them are those who will die before their missing loved one is returned to them, or before war criminals are brought to court and convicted. Their activism is fueled by a sense of urgency in this aftermath. Reconstituting social relations and restoring humanitarian values, however, are complex, time-consuming process. It is mundane, at times repetitive and tedious work. I'll end there. Justice dealing with the past in the Balkans, which examined ways in which political elites in the Western Balkans use institutions of post-conflict justice for local political purposes in the aftermath of the Yugoslav Wars. Please welcome the audience. Okay, so this is a tough act to follow. I'm gonna actually save this picture for my So um, what I'm going to talk about is the way in which the memory of communist violence gets transposed over the memory of more recent violence in the former Yugoslavia, such as the violence that Sarah just talked about, but also how it screams the memory of the Holocaust in the Western Balkans. And specifically, I'm focusing on Serbia and Croatia. Uh, the reason why I'm interested in this is that I find that the study of communism in post-communist Europe has a Yugoslavia problem. And it has a Yugoslavia problem because Yugoslav communism was simply unique in many ways, in ways that do not always fit our understanding of communism in the region. Yugoslav communism was unique most sig significantly in its departure from Stalinist orthodoxy, especially since 1948. It was unique in its political semi-liberalization and in its profound ideological focus on this supranational Yugoslav identity that Sarah mentioned, the brotherhood and unity, the Yugoslavness of the Yugoslav peoples. However, the communist regime carried out numerous human rights violations, including political purges, detention of dissidents, extrajudicial assassinations, as well as confiscation of property. In much of the rest of the post-communist region, the decisions on how to properly deal with communist violence were made as part of the larger democratic transition and as a declared break with the communist past. In the former Yugoslavia, by contrast, this communist past <coughs> morphed into ongoing nationalist debates over control over the federal state and what is the nature of the post-Yugoslav succession. So the year 1989 in Yugoslavia was not a transition to democracy like it was in the rest of East Europe. It was a transition to nationalism, to war, to violence. And because of this unique feature of Yugoslav post-communism, 
instead of dealing with legacies of communist crimes as part of a democratic reform, these crimes began fur be became further mythologized and they started to fuel new cycles of violence and injustice. So what I'm talking about today is really an analysis of this mythologizing process. I want to look at ways in which communist violence was used for nationalist mobilization in both Serbia and Croatia, specifically since the mid-1980s, and especially after 1989. So my analysis really points not only to the great variety in the memories of the past across Eastern Europe, but also to a particularly pernicious way in which the memory of communist crimes colors memory projects of the future making some topics <clears throat> worthy of remembrance and ignoring others. So this is what I'm going to do in the following order. I will first try to place the transition from communism in the former Yugoslavia in the context of the broader regional transitions and very briefly explain its unique character. I then want to describe particular practices of memory of specific communist crimes in Serbia and Croatia and I want to trace their political use for further nationalist mobilization in the region. And then I will conclude by some general remarks about the public memory of communist crimes in the former Yugoslavia and why they have continued significance. So let me say a few words about the challenge of multiple transitions in the East European space and especially in the former Yugoslavia. As most of East European uh, countries entered the 1990s with hope and excitement about the prospects of democracy, liberalism, human rights, after half a century of com com communist totalitarianism, former Yugoslavia entered this decade under very heavy clouds of looming war and total political and human insecurity. As the country broke apart along its seams, communism gave way to something much worse, to protracted civil war, to grim levels of violence, and ultimately to genocide. So given this lived experience across Yugoslav successor states, 1989 was not something to be celebrated. The transition from communism was a transition to nationalism and then to war. Overnight, the working communist Yugoslav people, as we were called in socialist Yugoslavia, became the Serbian people of Milosevic Serbia or the Croatian people of Franjo Tuđman's Croatia. So this was not a transition to democracy, but to pernicious ethnic politics. And it was not just the oncoming war that sullied the post-communist experience for much of ex-Yugoslavs. The interesting thing about Yugoslav communism was that it did not register as a particularly bad era for much of the Yugoslav population. Certainly in comparison to communisms elsewhere, Tito's version, Josip Broz Tito, Yugoslav leader's version, was significantly more overtly liberal while, of course, engaging in very strict political discipline and not allowing for much dissent. But the standard of living was much higher than in other communist countries. Most Yugoslavs had very few travel restrictions, so they did not feel like they lived in a cage. And ever since Tito broke off with Stalin in 1948, he refocused Yugoslav communism from a primarily economic doctrine to one about multiculturalism, about ethnic brotherhood and unity. So much of the communist effort was put in the construction of this durable, supranational Yugoslav identity with overt expressions of ethnic nationalism, including explicit religiosity, for example, consistently suppressed. This anti-Stalinist turn also endeared Tito's Yugoslavia both to Western governments, but also to many Western academics who became enthusiastic about the Yugoslav third way which included, for example, the economic experiment of workers' self-management that Jean-Paul Sartre wrote so favorably about, the non-aligned movement, and other innovative features of Yugoslav socialism. So this friendliness towards Tito's model also, I believe, contributed to the reluctance of some Western liberals to dig deep deeper into the country's human rights record. Now, the breakup of the Federation in 1991 was in part specifically about destroying this multinational Yugoslav identity, but also reasserting atomized, exclusionary ethnic identities across the Yugoslav political space. In fact, the very idea of brotherhood and unity had to be eradicated completely 
and replaced with a new construction. This time of a fatal and eternal historical conflict of the nations of Yugoslavia, as a contemporary Serbian textbook describes there. Much of the dominating Serbian and Croatian nationalist discourse in the 1990s was also explicitly about rejecting communist multinational identities and about rescuing, quote unquote, Serbian or Croatian identity from this perceived threat of the other. As part of this process, human rights abuses of the communist period were presented as evidence of a sustained communist conspiracy against Serbs by Croats or vice versa, depending on who was writing the historical transcript. Communist crimes, in other words, were never analyzed in a political vacuum. They were utilized for nationalist mobilization from the early 1990s onward and were very selectively activated for very specific nationalist purposes. For example, to further solidify the victimization narrative of one's own nation, to justify civil war as a break from communist oppression, and also to build a post-communist state on a profound rejection of the communist ideology by elevating previously suppressed expressions of identity, such as nationalism or religion. So communist remembrance became, in effect, confiscated by the new post-communist regimes. So the post-war legitimacy of the newly established former Yugoslav states rested on a rejection of communism and a reconnection with a pre-communist, more purely national character of statehood. This is why in both Serbia and Croatia, the post-1990s political elites, even in the aftermath of Milosevic's ousting in 2000 and Tudjman's death in 1999, insisted on rehabilitating many anti-communist public figures, including many anti-communists who were also pro-fascist allies, as I will demonstrate in a few minutes. The purpose of this agenda was to bypass the communist past and reaffirm the historical connection with pre-communist Serbia and pre-communist Croatia as proto-states that serve as inspiration for the contemporary manifestation of what ethnic statehood should look like. So these mnem mnemonic projects were led by very specific and clearly delineated political coalitions. In both Serbia and Croatia, after the collapse of the communist regime, the winning coalitions consisted of former communists who then turned virulent nationalists. Their political opponents, who were anti-nationalist liberals, saw as their principal political struggle the fight against nationalism and ethnic war. They were interested in exposing the crimes of the 1990s, whose perpetrators mostly got away with impunity or even enjoyed high positions in the post-war governments. The liberals had very little interest in revisiting the crimes of the communist era, when much more recent and by some measure more brutal crimes of the recent past were left unexamined and unpunished. So the consequence of this decision was that investigation of communist crimes was left, left to the nationalist bloc. And this particular twist on the red-black political cleavage meant that most of the examination of communist violence was conducted by nationalist authors and institutions who approached this historical project with a clear political agenda to demonstrate that communist crimes were just as bad, if not even worse, than the crimes of the 1990s. If this can be demonstrated, then the effort for accountability for the 1990s crimes can be delegitimized, demoralized, and ultimately defeated. So memory of communist crimes was politicized from the very beginning. It was ignored for political reasons by liberals. It was pushed for political reasons by nationalists. It reflected contemporary political divisions. And it is only within this context, I believe, that any analysis of transitional justice in the former Yugoslavia since 1989 can be carried out with any scholarly credibility. So let me say a few words specifically about uh, memory of communist crimes in Croatia and Serbia before I conclude. Now, Croatia emerged from the violent war of the 1990s, an independent state, for the first time in its history. Croatian national desire for statehood was so fundamental to Croatian national consciousness that former Croatian President Franjo Tuđman famously proclaimed that after becoming an independent state in 1991, Croatia had finally fulfilled, quote, its thousand-year-old dream. 
this Croatian longing for sovereignty is also rooted in a very problematic historical memory of the earlier Croatian state, a Nazi puppet entity that existed during World War II and that carried out numerous atrocities against non-Croats and other political enemies, including a systematic persecution and extermination of Croatian Jews. The Croatian homegrown fascist militia, the Ustasha, who modeled themselves after German and especially Italian fascists, were the enthusiastic executors of fascist rule throughout wartime Croatia. So this unfortunate complication with remembering communism in contemporary Croatia is that it was exactly the Ustasha and their apologists and sympathizers who were the strongest organized anti-communist forces in 20th century Croatia. This contested past and unsettling history of the 20th century in Croatia then delineated the memory and narrative fault lines that define much of contemporary Croatian memory projects. After 1999, there was an important piece of Croatia's identity construction that focused on complete rejection of its communist past and conflation of this past with Serbian hegemony. Mm. Communism, in other words, in Croatia was interpreted as an early project of greater Serbian domination, which is ironic because Serbian nationalists interpreted communism as exactly the opposite, as domination of Serbia by Croatian and Slovenian interests. So the true Croatia of the 20th century was then to be represented only by anti-communist forces. During the 1990s, while Franjo Tuđman was still in power, the central piece of Croatian state ideology was something called all Croatian reconciliation, which presupposed the unification of all Croatian people everywhere, Croatian communists, anti-communists, Ustasha sympathizers, and a vast Croatian diaspora which was a joint nationalist effort in pursuit of Croatian statehood. This reconciliation project views World War II as an unfortunate civil war among Croats, where Croatian partisans and Croatian nationalists both struggled for their vision of a Croatian state. So as a consequence of these priorities, much of remembrance of communist crimes became the domain of Croatia's right wing and fascist apologists. Croatian liberals were focused on advocating for justice for victims of crimes committed by Croatian troops in the 1990s, and the Croatian state was focused on avoiding much of this process and unifying the nation. This left the Ustasha apologists to take on this piece of the memory landscape. So many communist crimes remained completely ignored, such as, for example, post-war repression against German and Italian minorities, which is an issue that is rarely discussed even today in Croatia. The first changes in the way in which Croatia remembers the communist past occurred in the early 1990s, when streets, schools, and public buildings that carry the names of famous partisans or communist <coughs> leaders, as was the practice, obviously, across the East European space, were overnight changed into names of famous pre-communist Croatian public figures. For example, in September 1990, the square of the victims of fascism, Trg Žrtava Fascizma, which is a central square in Zagreb, was renamed the Square of Croatian Great Men. Please note the gender. <laughs> Other streets were renamed after officials of the fascist era independent state of Croatia. Public monuments suffered the same fate. Communist era monuments were replaced with statutes of pre-communist or anti-communist Croatian heroes, including public figures clearly and directly associated with the Ustasha regime, while thousands of communist era monuments were vandalized or completely destroyed. A thorough analysis of the types of communist monuments destroyed done by uh, Croatian historians uh, revealed that most of them, the destroyed uh, units, commemorated fascist massacres of Serbs and Jews. So this destruction of monuments continues in Croatia to this day, although with decreasing intensity and frequency. Today, for example, targets are monuments to Serb victims of Croatia's recent wars in the 1990s. The change in public remembrance of communism is perhaps best manifested in numerous public com commemorations of communist crimes, a paradigmatic example of which is the introduction to the public memory of the events at Bleiburg in today's Austria in 1945, where Croatian militiamen who fought on the side of Nazi Germany, as I explained, as enthusiastic collaborators, 
gained renewed historical acceptance as innocent victims, even martyrs of the nations, slaughtered by Serbian communists. Now, the Blybird massacre of 1945 began to be referred to in Croatia as the Way of the Cross, a name that invokes very clear Christian and martyrdom sentiments. Now, the truth about what actually happened at Blyberg in May 1945 is murky, but what is beyond much dispute is the fact that a few thousand remnants of Ustasha forces, some other Croatian militiamen, and many Croatian civilians were captured by Yugoslav Communist Partisan Army at the very end of the war as they were retreating near the Austrian town of Blyberg. While the number of victims has been hotly disputed over the years, with many Croatian nationalists inflating the number killed to as many as half a million, most scholarly consensus puts the number of killed somewhere near 7,000. But throughout the communist era, the events at Blyberg were not publicly discussed at all. And the only commemorations at the site were organized and attended by the Croatian diaspora. After the end of communism and the resurgence of Croatian nationalism in the 1990s, these commemorations at Blyberg became one of the central sites of Croatian nationalist mobilization. The attractiveness of the Blyberg remembrance to the anti-communist right is based first on the fact that Tito's regime suppressed any information of this massacre. And it therefore entered the realm of myths, half-truths, and legend. The Blyberg story remained alive in the creation of the pro ustasha diaspora, which over time developed its own version of the event and prepared it for public consumption in post-1991 Croatia with great assistance and involvement from the Croatian Catholic Church. But unlike its past commemorations, as the site of the communist army's massacre of Croatian, uh, primarily Ustasha soldiers, Blyberg in the Croatian public consciousness since 1990 began to be seen and commemorated as a communist assault on the entire Croatian nation. At the 50th anniversary of the Blyberg massacre in 1995, the speaker of the Croatian parliament addressed the assembly, calling Blyberg the Holocaust of Croatian martyrs. The parliament also instituted a day of Blyberg commemoration as a day of memory of Croatian victims in struggle for freedom and independence. So this historical myth-making was used to differentiate present-day ideological cleavages by constructing narrative continuity between Croatian anti-communism, Ustasha nationalism, and the 1990s war of independence. Croatian nationalists therefore built a seamless narrative connecting the events of World War II and those of the war of the 1990s, making the recent war <coughs> seem historically predetermined and inevitable, and using tenuous historical analogies to provide a particular interpretation of the most recent past. For example, at annual commemorations of the Blyberg executions, a frequent chant of Ante Ante can be heard, but not in memory of Ante Pavlovic, the leader of the fascist independent state of Croatia during World War II, but instead of Ante Gotovina, the Croatian general indicted for war crimes against the Croatian Serb population in 1995. Let me move on to communist memory in Serbia. Serbian politics in the 1990s underwent a profound transformation when the former communist ideology of the struggle of the working people seamlessly morphed into the nationalist struggle of the Serbian people. The nationalist myth-making carried out by Serbian political and cultural elites, including the Serbian Orthodox Church, advocate, advocated the idea that Serbia is a victim of vast outside conspiracies that want to conquer or destroy it. At the same time, the new Serbian history portrays Serbs as fighting on the right side of conflicts around the world, unlike their enemies, of course, and abstaining from doing any harm to their multiple and ever more vicious enemies. This particular state narrative of injustice, victimization, and collective grief provided a cognitive window through which the Serbian society and its elites began to see and interpret the world around them. It portrayed political action by perceived adversaries who at various times could be Slovenes, Croats, Bosniaks, Kosovo, Albanians, NATO, the US, the European Union, as perpetually threatening. So a politicized memory of Serbian history was used to conflate the past, including the communist past, 
with the present in order to interpret contemporary national problems as part of an ahistorical, eternal struggle of the Serbian people for survival. So a critical element of Serbian post-communist national identity construction was not so much the wholesale repudiation of communism, but more a subsuming of communism into the larger Serbian national story. So the ethnic identity of various communist leaders became much more important than their communist ideology. The fact that Tito, for example, was of Croatian origin factored greatly into this narrative of age-old, ahistorical Croatian oppression of Serbs. During Milosevic's rule in the 1990s, communism was neither the target of any serious evaluation nor were any crimes of communism systematically investigated. Only since 2000, since he was ousted, has communism become such a topic of great public interest in Serbia, with increasing numbers of newspaper articles, public exhibitions, and books dedicated to communist violence. But this renewed interest was not an organic development. It was part of a larger national project of linking contemporary Serbia with its golden era, quote unquote, which is this mythical pre-communist period when Serbia had full state sovereignty and was true to its core national identity. The new post Milosevic government presented itself as an embodiment of these classical Serbian values and as the force that got rid of Milosevic, who was the personification of communism. An important element of this project was the rehabilitation of Serbia's wartime army and militia, the Chetniks, who were used to be portrayed as pro-fascist Nazi collaborators throughout the communist period. But as a consequence of this new political agenda, almost the entire discussion of communist violence in Serbia became a discussion of communist violence against the Chetniks, who are no longer depicted as quislings, but as alternative anti-communist resistors to the Nazi regime. This Chetnik rehabilitation project has been particularly evident in education. Building on the early Chetnik rehabilitation efforts in Serbian historiography in the mid-1980s, contemporary Serbian history textbooks describe Chetniks as, quote, national patriots, even, quote, anti-fascist movement from the right, end quote. <laughs> I, I report you decide. <laughs> Fox News. <laughs> Chetniks are also today favorably portrayed as traditional, which is a good thing, I guess, and as protecting the interests of the Serbian people. So a recent comprehensive analysis of the currently used textbooks in Serbia finds only one book that mentions Chetnik crimes at all. But even that book only discusses Chetnik crimes against other Serbs, while Chetnik massacres, many massacres, against Bosniaks and Croats which are, by the way, abundantly covered in Croatian Bosniak contemporary textbooks, are completely ignored. The most egregious is the discussion of the government of Milan Medic, who was the fascist collaborator, Serbian uh, uh, prime minister, under whose reign Serbia was declared Juden and Fry in 1942, whom the current Serbian textbooks described as, quote, saving the biological essence of the Serbian nation, end quote. While well, his collaboration is explained and justified as, quote, he thought that Germany was too powerful and that collaboration with the occupier was necessary to prevent the suffering of the Serbian people, end quote. There's also a legal fight for Chetnik rehabilitation uh, that is going on. Just last Friday, there's a new lawsuit that the family of the Chetnik leader, Draža Mihailović, brought on uh, for, um, restitution and for throwing away his uh, uh, death sentence as a traitor uh, for which he was executed in 1946. So these fights over Chetnik legacy are very real. And I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to finish uh, with uh, this picture that I put up and tell you briefly what this is. There was a recent high-profile official memory project in Serbia that started in April 2014. So the Serbian Historical Museum in Belgrade, which is one of the main museums in the state, put up a very highly publicized multimedia exhibition, which is called In the Name of the People, Political Repression in Serbia, 1944 to 1953, so communist period. The exhibit promised to display new historical documents and evidence of communist crimes, 
which were ranging from assassinations, kidnapping, detention, and political traps. What the exhibition ended up showing actually were random and completely de decontextualized photographs of what the author said were victims of communism, which included many innocent people, but also many crew and fascist collaborators, all who were mentioned together as victims of communism. The exhibition made no effort to clarify the political context in which these crimes were committed, other than to group them under the heading of communist terror. But perhaps the most egregious, in fact, definitely the most egregious, is this picture here, number 11. Can somebody tell me what's wrong with this picture? Those are Jews. Well, yes, okay, well, yes. Picture number 11 is a photograph of prisoners from Dachau concentration camp. And the caption, which you cannot see underneath, said, the example of living conditions of communist Goli Otto prisoners. Okay? These are real people who died at Dachau, who are now used as examples of how horrible the communist camp for communist dissidents on the island of Goli Otto was. I visited this exhibit in May of 2014, inquired about the status of the disputed photograph, and was told that there are no plans for its removal because nobody complained. <laughs> okay? Alright, so the significance of such a memory project and such a memory approach, which is sanctioned by the state, this is the official Serbian Historical Museum exhibition, is to first construct and then institutionalize a particular hegemonic public memory of past violence, which serves as screen memory, replacing the public memory of more recent past. So the way in which communist violence is discussed in today's Serbia and Croatia is problematic, obviously, for many reasons. The ideological commitment to national reconciliation of both fascist and anti-fascist forces of the 20th century clearly equates fascism and communism as two sides of the same totalitarian coin, which is an ideological equivalency that has been promoted by the highest offices of the European Union. This focus on national reconciliation, as Aida Hozic shows, promotes national homogenization and frequently externalizes responsibility for crimes to the Germans or the Soviets. By equating Nazi and fascist collaborators and anti-fascists, it erases the memory of resistance and sometimes even criminalizes it. By individualizing victimhood, it institutionalizes forgetting of crimes committed against particular groups, for example, against the Roma, or homosexuals, or Slavs, or communists. And it precludes possible discomforting comparisons with the present treatment of minorities. But mostly by emphasizing World War II and communist crimes, it deals with the communist past parenthetically, limiting serious and critical inquiry of everyday practices that sustained and undermined communist regimes for over 50 years. Thank you very much. <laughs> Researches 20th century modernity and the uses of the past in contemporary societies. His geographic and cultural interests range from Russia and the Soviet Union to Europe, the US, and ancient civilizations. Uh, particularly important to Tom's research and teaching is the role of media in the constitution of knowledge and information of disciplines and movements. Thank you, Barb, for asking me to participate in this. Um, and two wonderful papers, thoughtful, enjoyed reading them three and four times. Um, That's one thing that I read. <laughs> it's my duty. Um, and th I mean, Barb, thanks too for the um, discussion at the beginning of the panel that sort of placed the interests. And if I, if I could summarize the interest that I heard Barb describe, it seemed as though what you were saying is, um, there's a kind of self-reflection that you want to act activate 
on the various uh, strands and agendas of transitional justice. Mm -hmm. And self-reflection can come in many ways. Um, it involves, in a way, as focusing on the taken for granted. What, what do we take for granted in the practice of this academic field? Um, what are, are we taking for granted and what shouldn't we take for granted? And one way to do that is, of course, to ask how other disciplines, other fields do something. What are the, how does the concept work over there? And maybe that's useful as we, as we do this work of self-reflection on our own, on our own field or discourse. So to the extent that I can contribute here, I was a little nonplussed when Barb asked at first, but I mean it's, I would say it's this interest that I have in what we do as historians. What do historians do? How have they come so naturally to do this work of writing history? What does history involve, for example, uh, in other places? What does the writing of history involve in other places? Um, what institutions are needed to write good history? Who decides what good history is? Um, what are the different discourses that, that both promote it and that, that, he, that good history is set, is defined against? So the more I thought about it, the more I read the papers, I realized, well, maybe there's a way that I could talk about the papers from my different angle, which again does not interact that much with transitional justice or the, the kinds of anthropological or political scientific things, but is in, I think, in what you said. So I was reading your papers and thinking, oh, this is going into the next uh, you know, class that I'm going to do. This is, gonna, th this is wonderful way, I mean, I, I saw all these commonalities and all these kind of common links. So maybe it'll be useful. That's, that's sort of a, a, my way of starting. So it seems to me that uh, Yelena's paper is a fascinating overview of the politics of history and memory in Croatia, and certainly. Sadly, what you write makes perfect sense. But let me explore some of what I'm struggling with after reading the paper and hearing your, represent, your, your presentation. So could we say that in a polity divided by violent ideological conflicts, the ability to represent the past will be sought by groups in an effort to construct a single hegemonic vision that helps them consolidate a sense of who they are. As different groups come to power, they will use their positions of authority and control over resource, economic resources to shape the content and supply of authoritative accounts of the past as well as to orchestrate the public's relation to the past. They will choose which events to narrate. Uh, strongly encourage, if not demand, the use of a particular vocabulary in the narration of these events and marginalize contrasting versions of the same events. So one of my questions then concerns the place of transnational justice in such a political and cultural context. From the paper, the impression is given that transnational justice, and maybe not just from the paper, but I, I guess this is in a sense a question. Um, the impression, I have the impression that one way from the outside transitional justice appears is as a kind of metacultural technique that can be brought to at least potentially all societies that have experienced wrenching conflicts in the not so distant past. Several moments in the paper suggest you know, that one of your main interests is in how the field of transi transitional justice is coping with all the different contexts within which it finds itself. I think it was like pages two and three you make reference to the field, uh, that you work it, it, to this field. So given that, I wonder what you make of this observation and assertion. Transitional justice can only really work in a society that's experienced a drastic overturn one that brings not only a new political system, but a revaluation of the relationship of the past to everyday life. Instead of the past existing as for some people, orchestrated triumphalist spectacle, and for others as suppressed articulation, silent transgressive memories and forbidden identifications, the past becomes the subject of the measured judgment of a special class of writers whose principal credential is their ability to give a true account of the past. The relevant transition here is from myth-making to history writing. With history writing being one part of a much larger institutional and cultural shift that involves media systems and practices, educational institutions and attitudes, uh, legal structures, assumptions, to name a few facets of the enormous changes that take place when a liberal order 
is actually brought into being, is, nur is nursed into existence, is, is designed in the attempt to implant it. So I should stress that one of liberal history writing's most curious traits is its lack of interest in the present. I'm not saying that its writers are not interested in the present. Some are, some aren't. But the creation of works of history must in some way disengage from the claims of the present in order to find validation. After all, its main audience is other historians who judge a work not on its power to move readers, but on its methodological rigor, judicious <coughs> use of sources, careful weighing of different kinds of evidence. So could we say that the most important requirement for transitional justice is paradoxically the kind of liberal distance bordering on indifference that operates so powerfully in the, emerge, uh, in the historical profession in liberal states. The paradox derives from the emergence of a powerful felt need for explanations of the past in these societies. And yet this demand is to be met by those whose professional standing is based in part on being largely indifferent to this need. So there have certainly been places in the recent past where we could say that a kind of inversion has indeed taken place. In South Africa after 1994, the entire system for producing knowledge about the past shifted dramatically. I'm not sure the word revolution is the right word, but a drastic redefinition of what it meant to live in the country took place. Of course, new constraints appeared in the form of shrinking economic resources with which to pay historian salaries and to maintain old and create new archives. But there was a sense that at least the myth-making of the Afrikaner regime was at an end. The new task was to make sense of the historical processes that led to its collapse. My sense is that a similar process took place in Poland in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, building on the foundation of what JP said yesterday about the deep sort of liberal momentum of the society in the entire post-war era. There, a similar kind of consensus on the meaning of the past as history took shape. There, history writing takes place within a largely liberal framework that includes a distance between present and past, and the normalcy of a separation between cultural and civic forms of belonging. So needless to say, in the societies in the countries of former Yugoslavia, they have not seen such a liberal consolidation as we've just heard. Their myth-making continues to occupy the space of the past. For the liberal historian, myths are dangerous because they're powerful stories that make no claim to the state, no effort to prove their status as truth. Myths help assemble crowds of like-minded believers who use mythic stories to find a position in a conflictual past. Given the longer history of Yugoslavia, we should hardly be surprised that myths circulate with such authority and power, as liberal governmentality flickered only briefly in a century of upheavals marked by the machinations of party politicians, grasping monarchs, fascist dreams of purified territories, and communist projects of organizing socialist utopia. Sarah's paper, too, is a vivid evocation of this same phenomenon although its gaze is focused closer to the ground. We have here a recently invented polity, Bosnia-Herzegovina, a country divided into two federal regions that its designers hope that will with time form liberal roots and infrastructures, both men, physical and mental. Such an institutional assemblage has had little time to take shape, much less generate loyalty or trust. And while the war ended 20 years ago, the mental spiritual struggles over peace home in the past obviously continue. She focuses on a shattering, horrific event, an event during wartime that was declared by the ICTY, another of the 20th century's uh, genocides. The event now lives on in the minds and memories of survivors and their families, and it is immediately at hand whenever Bosniaks ask themselves who they are. So what's happened to this horrific event since the end of the war? Well, for the Bosniak community of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the settlement of the war, the imposition of peace by NATO, brought with it a particular way of understanding what happened in July 1995. The killing in Srebrenica and environs was almost immediately framed as a mass crime based on ethnic hatred. 
this frame, each dead body represented a discrete act with a victim and perpetrator. Each was a discrete prosecutable act. And in principle, those responsible could be found and brought to justice. This was a crucial framing, not just for Bosniaks, but also for the wider European community, whose failures to, in policing and controlling the region were seen to have made the killing possible. This frame imported the entire apparatus of liberal justice, which at its core has both facts and facticity, as Sarah writes. This included the technology of DNA matching, so that the following kinds of statements could be made with near complete certainty. This is the body of your son. This is the body of your father. And yet, because of what Yelena discusses in her paper, these facts, this accounting of deaths in the service of assembling a true story of the crime, has been swept up into narratives that go beyond the here and now fact of identification and become subsumed into larger mythic stories that do that explain things like the origins of the war, the innocence of the Bosnians, their unprecedented premeditated victimization, etc. The fact, this is the body of my son, becomes a narrative. My father was killed here. My son was murdered here. And the place where they died becomes a place of memory, where rituals are performed in commemoration and acted. These places and commemorations are simultaneously a sign of the new order, but also a danger to it. On the one hand, the monuments and participants are physically secure from harm, protected by a new legal system, but the emotion and suffering they entail loom much larger than just recognition or acknowledgement of a 20-year-old crime. These are places where suffering and grief overflow and the attempt to contain them. they are sites like the Nazi extermination camps that indelibly mark the landscape with signs of barbarity, tragedy, senseless. So this is one mythic frame. On the other side, of the mythic divide are the Bosnian Serbs who tell a very different story about the killing of the men and boys in and around Srebrenica in 1995. For them, this act was the execution of people the militias considered future killers in a war of extermination. They only appeared as guileless civilians. Their deaths were in fact typical of what happens in the course of a guerrilla war. And thus the Bosnian Serbs would reject and do reject an identity of their actions during the war with Nazi murders and Jews. Thus the judgment of genocide is unfair in their view, and itself a sign that some larger hidden agendas at work challenging the right of the Serbian people to exist. Which brings us to Pilis. These towns and villages are, after all, in the Republic of Serbska, a polity born of ethnic cleansing, and that so far has only myth with which to inscribe it in the past. Thus, it would be really surprising if there was not a counter monument in Pilitz. If the Orthodox <coughs> cross did not appear one day superimposed on the partisan red star. To me, these are the kinds of marks produce, produced by mythic frames. Thus, I have a different reading of the story about Mark Harmon. To me, the passage articulates so perfectly the reactions of someone whose entire life and work have unfolded in liberal frames. <laughs> His utterances of horror and shock presume a whole host of ordered, predictable subjectivities based upon liberal assumptions about empathy, respect, responsibility. But myths don't tell the stories of liberal subjects, whose conduct is guided by foundational ideas like decency, equality. The human participants in mythic stories see the world differently. And the question is how, as we observers from this position, this liberal moment, this place, this liberal practice of history writing, how we see them, how we make sense of this, given where we sit and what our motivations are. So in conclusion, as I mentioned, I'm left most curious about the nature of the field of transitional justice and about its assumptions, its philosophical sources and allegiances, its methodological orientations, and most of all, its understanding of how the past exists in and lives through the present. How does it operate in places where legal liberal order has not already made space for it? Does the West offer it just as a tool for the toolkit to further creation of the liberal nation state? To me, the context of the former Yugoslavia is so interesting, not so much as a place where the field of transitional justice might be having a hard time, but as a place where people experience and confront very different ways in which the past circulates in the 
one thing we who are interested in, we who are interested in these questions can always do is to take a slightly longer view. We lament the existence of myth because it makes justice so difficult. But aren't these myths also the sign of a culture and society struggling to think again, or struggling to think in the context of what must appear to many Bosnians and Serbs a very confusing cultural formation, namely the looming liberalism of the EU flavor? Perhaps we should imagine a much longer and less dramatic transition not so much a dramatic overturning, an inversion that puts liberal history in place, but a slow erosion of the exhausting processes of mythic engagement, commitment, belief. Whether the bedrock that gets revealed is the liberalism congenial to the managers of Europe's future is yet another question. Maybe that's a terrible metaphor, I don't think. But more ethnography, that's the issue. Thank you. response and uh, to a wonderful panel. And uh, it, given that we want to preserve our time to engage the audience in questions, I'm going to hold on on my questions, um, which uh, um, and, and um, I'm wondering if you would each like to respond briefly to Tom's response and before we open it to questions, if you've had time to really yeah, think, think about that. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. And uh, really screaming. It's just the Serbian thing. This was really interesting. And uh, let me, I just want to say one thing that came out of your comments that I've been thinking about as well and ties into Barbara's your introduction was from the position of accountability, and you quoted Catherine seeking and the age of accountability and especially the age of international criminal accountability and individual accountability and this is where I used to be uh, that's how that's that's the discourse that I started from and my first book is very much embedded in that discourse of accountability and justice and and I was outraged that uh, Serbia, Croatia, and Bosnia abused these international models of justice and accountability and wrote a whole book about it and now, I am not even there. I'm so disillusioned with the idea that there even should be um, an, I'm disillusioned with the idea that the proper way to deal with crimes of such magnitude is individual criminal accountability. I think that the problems are so much deeper. I mean, this, was lot, this is going on now. There's no individual criminal accountability of anybody at the Hague that will that would have pre prevented this manipulation of the Holocaust. So I'm gonna give up on the individual criminal accountability, and I'm gonna give up on the transitional justice part of it, and I'm gonna be more interested in the memory part of it and in the kind of broader normative and educational transformation, uh, which is, seems to be what you are more interested in. And I think this is where the questions today are, and I think. I'm, I'm, it, it may be too strong of a statement to say that we wasted our time those last 15 years focusing on prosecuting individuals and making sure that the due process is served. But I kind of feel that so much effort was placed into the justice part of it with very limited res resonance on the ground, as Sarah can tell us more than anybody. I mean, it's hard to talk to people who have lost so much and expect them to feel justice. It's unclear. I mean, Hannah Arendt said this, you know, way back. Uh, there's no there's no justice for genocide. I mean, what, what are we um, trying to do here? So I think it's more interesting looking at education, public narratives, popular culture, film, ways in which people's <coughs> ideas about the past can be transformed over time and less on individualizing criminal behavior. Because I think that Structurally, these crimes are group crimes that were committed by groups against groups, and they're ill-fitting for the individual criminal accountability architecture that we have set up at international level. So that's where I'm moving on next. I would add to that. I mean, I, when I talk about the work of forensic science in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
you know, I, I work through these different registers of valence and, um, and ramifications. And I always, and not to say that these are registers that are separate, meaning the individual, the familial, the communal, the national, they're intertwined, they affect one another. Always I come back because when I argue that um, the socio-political consequences have in fact been divisive, right, that you go to the Srebrenica Potitari Memorial Center, and there really are only Bosniaks there. Um, my Bosnians are friends who talk about it, not derisively, but see it as their mecca, right? And see it as a place that is not um, a space that encompasses their own experiences, right? So the identification and burial of these individual victims becomes a space that um, is alienating for them and at times indicting for them. So I, and when I say that, I don't say that to eclipse the work of the everyday and the work of um, the most intimate, meaning that when a family member receives the remains of a loved one, even if it is a few tiny bones, and when they lift up that coffin, they say, it's too light, right? They recognize that's not, that's not the entire body. That that nevertheless is, it is a form of reconstruction or repair that's happening on an individual basis, and that does work. I mean, in the sense of um, Tom LaCour, the, the work of the dead, he has a book that's coming out, that does work. Right? that does work on an intimate and individual level. That's what interests me. And that's the area also where I see possibilities for members of you know, a divided uh, society on, in telling their stories, not their myths, but telling their stories, sharing their losses. When I, I have two friends who sit together and drink coffee, uh, Bosnian Serb and, and Bosnian Muslim, and they, they can broach the subject, but just barely, around the edges, and talk about what does it mean to bury your, your cousin or so on and so forth. So I think that, I, when we talk about the socio-political, I, I never want to lose sight of the intimate, the familial, the individual, because I think if, if there is an exit for Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's because of those, the everyday and the mundane work of trying to live together once again. And so, um, and I, that, I suppose that comes out also in um, artistic representations, where I see possibilities for shared expression and conversation and dialogue. Um, it's typically within artistic representations, discussions about those, and with youth activism. So it's an, and there, these are youths who have not benefited from a curriculum that explains various different perspectives either. So there's a, a work that's being done in Bosnia Herzegovina um, among a population um, a, a different segment of the population that, that is trying to break past the restrictive narratives and, and mythologizing of the past. Thank you for adding those interesting dimensions. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions, but I'm going to um, take the, the, uh, the chance to, to start with the first question, hopefully to engage some of this um, second round of conversation. You know, what's, what struck me about not only your presentations, but the presentations of this morning, are that um, if there's something that seems really, really obvious to me that every grouping tries to manipulate memory, right? So that there's nothing new or surprising in, in this finding that, that we, we, we don't we don't want to take the blame, we want to push off the blame, and we want to um, take on our own victimization. At least that's um, my observation of, uh, and so what I see about the accountability project is that at least it's a new project. It's not just allowing the space for competitive myth-making within national contexts. And so, you know, one of the questions I have is, it, and you know, really interesting, Elena, it, your comment about you know starting from this place and then realizing how inadequate uh, that criminal accountability is, and then really taking off on Tom's point of ethnography is what we need. You you make, uh, you know, Sarah, you make this really profound point about how, it, you know, for the victims, it's really it means something. You know, it's very. Uh, it's very personally important. So, so my question, and then I'm going to open it up for several questions um, from the room, is um, really: Are these? Is this new project of accountability, accountability at least in a, in negotiation with the existing 
narratives, the existing myth making, is it does it at least um, stand as something new against which um, these myth makers need to be conscious um, that there's someone else watching? And I think you know Yugoslavia is a really interesting example because I have this sense that people were the international community was so exhausted with uh, the fighting in former Yugoslavia that once you know they managed the Dayton Accords for all their ridiculousness and got the guns to stop and they had set up the International Criminal Tribunal that they just left you know except for the international communities in Kosovo still running it I think but the the point is and maybe it's that it's that lack of commitment to the international from the international community to continue to engage in more positive ways that that creates a vacuum that allows the the natural tendency to myth making to take over so anyway i don't want to dominate that all so we're going to take let's take three or four more questions you welcome yes thank you very much fascinating presentations um as depressing as they might be um i <laughs> that's my yeah. I think they were part depressing, and, and this is where you are much greater experts on the regions than I am, uh, but they were frighteningly homogeneous, as though there was a one narrative that defines the history of Croatia or the history of Serbia, and that makes me suspicious. Uh, it seems that there are uh, segments in the populations, that there are countervailing political forces that have their own myths and narratives. It is quite conceivable that there is some kind of hegemony, that there is a dominant narrative. Uh, and, and in this context, I would also say there is room for the people are members of nations, and they identify, this is most obvious in the but people also identify themselves as individuals. They, I have no doubt, have a notion of an understanding of the notion of individual dignity and individual responsibility, responsibility beyond their allegiance to the nation. Uh, in this sense, I'm skeptical uh, toward an overarching skepticism toward uh, criminal justice responses and writes about, um, certainly we, we don't know the counterfactual, but I would not want to know what the German mindset looks like today, the German construction of, of the history of the Holocaust, had there not been the Nuremberg Tribunal, had there not been the trial against the police battalions in Hamburg, had there not been the Auschwitz, the Auschwitz trial in, in Frankfurt, had there not been the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, these were important tools uh, of, of attributing individual justice in ways that are not without problems. I'm absolutely, uh, absolutely convinced of that, but still contributed to the writing of, of history. And they are never alone. I think in traditional justice debates, the limits of criminal trials are very much acknowledged. And the, the conclusion today is that they trials must be combined with other mechanisms, for example, truth commissions, uh, which have uh, use a different institutional logic than trials do and are able to reveal other aspects of historic truth than trials are able to reveal. So, I, so there was a bit too much homogeneity and too little space for the notion of individual responsibility that uh, criminal trials can respond to. Maybe it just goes too long, but uh, thank you for this. Let's take a question. Uh, I've got a question, but let's start with Friedrich Nietzsche. He distinguished in this short essay of his, in the business of history, a notion of the uh, history in the service of life. It seems to me you should take it serious. It's not some objective historiography. It means each historiography serves something, not that somebody, but some purpose. Which means all those mythologization of the past is in the service of something. 
it serves to some goals, some political goals. And so the first part. And the second part is listening to the, the conferences of the social justice, of talking about social justice, justice, people there possess a perhaps hard on the right side. But they are big, you know, talks about the dignity, responsibility, accountability, and so on and so I, I want to be a more pedestrian. It means my question is such. Is possible to trace this, this mythologization of the past to some very narrow economical interest in the state? Which means if, as you mentioned here, and the picture shows that actually this mythologization is being <laughs> spread by the apparatus, ideological apparatus of the state. The reform, it seems to me, they serve for some interest. If for some interest, whose interest? What sort of the in economical interest of the ruling elites, actually, at the moment, in Serbia and Croatia, promote such not other type of the mythologizing history? Yeah, I'll, I think I'll just briefly respond to that. I think Yelena has much more to say on it than I, but um, my quick response would be, it doesn't, so that doesn't interest me, but um, to define an economic origin leads for me to a functionalist argument, and that uh, precludes a, a, a more nuanced understanding, not so much where, who perpetuated, who, who crafted it, who perpetuated, but how does it circulate? How does it gain some kind of root in the, the life of the 80-year-old Bosniak peasant who tried to return, right? You know, I want that, and that's me as a social anthropologist. Not that I don't want to understand where it came from, I want to understand its social life afterwards, right? And the political effects of that, which become so entrenching, which um, disable <coughs> discourse, disable dialogue. Yeah. So then I can also answer the, the last question and then I'll go in reverse order and get to bar. So I, I, yeah, I, I agree with Sarah. I mean, of course it serves interest, but I don't think the economic interest is what's in, interesting here. I think it's the ideological interest and the interest of the ruling elites in control of the narrative. Control of the narrative is control of population. I mean, as Foucault said that, it's, you know, somebody here mentioned liberal governmentality. That's the whole point. It's the control of population and, and construction of a particular hegemonic discourse that is difficult to challenge. There are different discourses available, but they have lost the discursive battles. Mm -hmm. I mentioned briefly, and um, I have more in the paper, about the reason why the liberal voices were so silenced in the discussion of communism. They had their own uh, history and relationship with communism that kind of painted them in a corner of being communists themselves, so they're not objective interpreters of the past. If these are you know, former communists now turn into liberals. But also, there is um, the issue of how much public space is devoted to different public narratives. So it's not a question of only ex one narrative existing, but one narrative, which narrative counts, which narrative has more space in the official public arena? Who gets on TV? Who gets called to discuss this on TV? Uh, who covers this exhibition? Is it just one paper? How does this paper cover it? It's the issue of who gets access to present their story. So, for example, as I said, this is the official uh, state historical museum. So this is the official narrative. This is the big museum in downtown Belgrade that you pass by. It's right next to the parliament that everybody knows. There are many other smaller centers and NGOs and things called Center for Cultural Decontamination that builds on things like, you know, denazification, and it's a wonderful NGO that's hidden in a courtyard behind a building that's under dispute that 500 people maybe know about and maybe 100 people go to. So this is an existing counter-narrative, but it does not get equal access because the people who go there are not in the mainstream of cultural elite that gets invited to present their story. So there's a control of cultural production that dominates which narrative gets uh, credence in society. So I, I mean, I'm just, I, I want to be very clear and say that I'm not arguing that there was only one narrative. It's that this is the narrative that won. There might be a discursive battle in the future. Maybe there will be a, a, a different winner. But right now, this is the, this is the winner. Um, so you also asked, how is it that I'm assuming 
and I think Sarah as well, of, of kind of this ethnic identity that covers individual identity. I think that, I'm gonna speak or, or <laughs> for you as well, there's a profound ethnification of these societies. In, in many ways, really surpassing an individual. People identify themselves through their ethnic belonging. Now, that's, this is a constructed identity, it's not organic identity, this is a constructed identity, this is a politicized identity, this is a manipulated identity, but society is profoundly ethnified. Cultural products are ethnified. Leadership is ethnic. People think through <coughs> their daily decisions in ethnic terms. People make decisions in Bosnia who they're gonna vote for on ethnic terms, whose wedding they're going to attend to in ethnic terms. People in Serbia, which is now much more homogenous, obviously, with, with very few minorities, think about their political leadership in ethnic terms. This last name, is he a Slovak? I don't know. That somehow is an important measure of, in voting patterns. And this is all the legacy of 1980s and 1990s nationalist mobilization, where, as I briefly discussed, the ideology of the working people transformed into the, the ideology of the Serbian people. People. Your identification with your class, which was your primary identification of communism, just got replaced by an identification with the nation. And I cannot overemphasize how present that ethnic tenor to culture still is, which is clearly one of the most problematic aspects of the entire post-conflict transition. And so to go back to uh, Bart's point about whether maybe if the internationals just had a little bit more of a longer attention span, I don't think that that is really an issue. I think where the internationals, well, first of all, if it hadn't been for the international involvement, I don't think we would have anything. I mean, I think there's, there's certainly easy to criticize internationals, but if it, if it wasn't for the ICTY, we wouldn't have any domestic trials. It sets something in motion so that at least the issue is being discussed. However, the way in which the international actors assessed success or failure was in a very mechanistic fashion. All they cared about, and this is what like EU conditionality was tied to how many people are arrested, are they captured, are they in the Hague? If they are, we are done here. Which is, all, this is when the story should have begun. Not where it ended, and, but it ended. And so when finally Karadzic and then Hadzic and Mladic finally were arrested, the Serbian Prime Minister at the time, Mirko Cvetković, came on TV and said, finally, the Hague story is over. Now, this was when it was supposed to begin. The whole theory of transitional justice is you arrest these big figures, and then you, through the trials, create a historical transcript, they tell you what happened. You, they ended the story. So the perverse effect of the Hague Tribunal was to end the transitional justice process, at least at that stage, instead of beginning. Um, and this is I'll prompt a short answer. Do you have any reason to be hopeful for the next decade? And on the contrary is, in the next decade, what are the hot spots or potentials for conflict that you, you, you can uh, surmise or guess on? In the world? <laughs> no, in, in the region. Yugoslavia. Okay. All right. Sonia. Thank you so much for both of these presentations and the framings. Maybe you can stand. It's, uh, Thank you for the, the presentations and the framings. And I'm coming at this from um, about 10 years of theatrical work in former Yugoslavia with youth. So um, I guess I hold what may be a naive hope for the disturbance of performance and ritual into the dominant cultural narrative. And I'm just curious if either, if either one of you, if you mentioned the Center for Cultural Decontamination, I don't know if you're the, familiar with the work of Dach and the, yep. the kinds of interventions in public space that they were able to make visible in the 90s in Serbia and kind of ongoing work. And I'm just wondering, because both the, the examples you gave of this official narrative and its, and its um, dominance in the public sphere are so monumentalizing. I mean, they're about these exhibits in the, in the, the, the buildings and the memorial that's the images in the public space. And the, the counter-narratives I know of are kind of um, performance interventions, 
of the women in black coming in at the 10th anniversary of Srebrenica and standing with the Bosnian women and, and showing this kind of moment of possibility of a different kind of, of narrative uh, of encounter of working together. Is that, is that kind of only possible in a, as a temporary rupture into this dominant space? Or are there, is there a possibility that those moments of performance that for me really enable a different kind of effective relationship to emerge and a different kind of empathetic relationship to potentially emerge? Um, is it possible that that might have the potential to intervene in this dominant discourse in any way? Thank you very much for the presentation. I um, wanted to ask about this ethnic boundaries in a post-conflict, post-genocide society, and I found it fascinating and uh, what uh, the phenomenon of the victims of Srebrenica being uh, marked as Islamic and as Shahids, as martyrs, you know, and so this, this transition from including a very wide group, marking them as, as uh, uh, Muslims. So my question is, and we had uh, similar, I mean, I had, a, we had this point in Madrid when we first met, and I, I just, uh, it's a follow-up question on that conversation we had, because to what extent the genocide frame is facilitating uh, this retroactive marking of boundaries that were created by the perpetrators and then assumed by the victims. Somehow the death, the killing, operates as a reality effect. And whether this is problematized at all by these groups that are active in, in memory work. Strebrenica community and the way in which um, the, all of the victims, save for one, is known as a, a Croat or uh, buried as Catholic. Um, there is a real, there is a, a political stance that that the entire not entire. I mean, there are maybe, there are exceptions, but there are very few um, among the surviving families who believe that the act was collective. These were individuals targeted because of their identity as a member of a group that they die, that they suffered together and they died together, that um, it's it's necessary. The, the response, the humanist response, is to bury them together in this collective space. And when you listen to survivors talk about their aspirations, and this was years ago when they were beginning to envision what the Memorial Center would look like, they wanted um, a sea of white tombstones because they wanted the collectivity to come across, the scale to come across, now, the, you know, the, the ramification of that has been um, who takes care of the dead. With the, they're buried, because they were members of an ethno-national, ethno-religious group, who takes care of them is the Islamic community. And that opened um, space for that association, the Islamic association, to, um, to make statements about the status of those dead. And in fact, the, the forensic, the problematics of the bodies themselves if you're a Bosnian Muslim killed, um, your body needs to be cared for in a particular way by assigning the status of shehi, the martyr. It, it, uh, it's as if it circumvents the required religious ritual. Now they can be buried partially. Now they can be buried and honored and prayed for even without remains recovered. So it does, it, it, it allows for, it overcomes the aporias of absence and the aporias of a body mutilated and disposed of in these horrific ways. So there's there are ways in which you can see the Islamic community is is, is providing um, an, an exit from the loss and, and the, the suffering. Right? So I think that's one thing. Um, I'm going to try and move to the other questions quickly. Uh, um, hope is there hope? Um, there were general elections this past fall in Bosnia and Herzegovina that were incredibly disappointing. And, and I say incredibly disappointing because for so many people who had um, at least 
maintain the possibility that there will be a different sort of government, different res uh, representation. In fact, it reverted back to the nationalist parties once again control. And I think that, more than anything for the Bosnian youth, and, and here's my answer to, to performativity and the possibilities there, this is incredibly frustrating for younger members of the society who want to live a different life, not one beholden to the past, and are looking for ways in which to express their uh, hopes and aspirations apart from what their families, their, their parents may have experienced, what they themselves did not experience. Um, where do I see then hope is again in some of these creative um, uh, productive spaces, including in Srebrenica, the most successful of all. And in fact, there was all kinds of international intervention. I mean, money was poured into that place. The most successful, if you ask me, of the NGOs and the work is the Friends of Srebrenica. It's an organization that gets Bosnian Muslim and Bosniak, uh, Bosnian, Bosniak and Bosnian Serb youth to, to uh, produce radio and television sort of journals, and they rarely talk about them. They talk about the environment <laughs> and how they need to clean it up and things like that. So they're, they're not that they're preoccupied, but they're trying purposely to move outside of that space. So just briefly, again, on the alternative voices, I always feel like I'm a kind of traitor to the cause because all those people are my friends. I grew up in Belgrade. The director of the Center for Cultural Determination is one of my closest friends. And then I, and I always say they don't matter <laughs> when I go to international conferences. Hope they never find out what I actually say. So, uh, I, I, of course, these are wonderful initiatives. My my frustration is more with the lack of public space that I get, because you know I when I lived in Belgrade, I would go to their performances every week, and it was the same 50 people yeah. always, all to say hi to each other, and we <laughs> hang out. They're the same people, and so that's wonderful. And you know the the performances were you know. Uh, each year, they were more and more radical, and they were questioning, and they had mothers of Srebrenica come, and they were the first to have a, uh, something dedicated to war crimes in Kosovo. All fantastic, the 50 people. Like, we would notice when somebody does a shop, oh, is Srijan sick? Why is he not here? I mean, this is the level. So at some point, you have to see, like, okay, so what is, what's the impact of this? Because the, the Serbian uh, TV doesn't send a reporter to report on this. The main newspaper doesn't send a reporter to report this. So it's just us kind of hanging out, drinking. It, it doesn't serve a narrative transformative purpose. With all the wonderful things that they've accomplished that I've witnessed over the years. So it's, I'm, I'm not sure what to say other than it's really the, 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 the narratives are so hegemonic that it's so difficult to crack open. And there's also an issue of personal security. I mean, people were assassinated in Serbia for expressing political opposition. These are not, I mean, this is not an issue of, you know, it, it's kind of not a joke anymore. And, and Serbia is currently in the period of clamping down again on personal liberties and on media freedom. And I think people are getting more afraid again um, so I, I don't envy these alternative voices, but I, I, I do respect them immensely. Um, yeah. So the only, the only thing I would, would, would say, um, first of all, about the, the question in the back there, um, a fascinating thing to be written yet is the evolution of these myth-making processes and the way of starting, um, starting when. I mean, these are deep cultural stories that become possessed by different institutions and then become a currency, become used, become instrumentalized, have certain effects. The effects are then reacted to and new strategies are arise. And some of them are economic, but as we, as we heard, some are, I mean, I think they're all over the place. The other thing to, to say is that, I mean, from JP's presentation last night, it's so clear that these things are in process now. And as you, you, you two have just said, this is all you've referred to the kind of a, a present moment, which is uncertain and things are happening that were maybe not anticipated six months ago. So this idea of the Saudi money that comes to influence what gets, what sort of media gets produced. And where was it? In, what the, it's in, uh, in, uh, in, in Ukraine. 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 Uh, right, right. The, the largest public uh, higher education institution. Right, so somebody, that's a pretty significant new equation as this scene unfolds. But um, you know, no matter what unfolds, it's always good to hope. So 